Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our last program of 2022. I want to thank the Teton County Library. We love this venue and we're honored to be able to use it. Uh, I would like to remind everyone in this room to mute your cell phones, please. And uh, those of you on Zoom, you can do what you like. So it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Leaf has done three other talks for us and given us a amazing back room tour of the museum in Pocatello, the Idaho Natural History Museum. So uh, Leaf grew up in Ontario, Canada, and studied as an undergrad, learned to love rocks and fossils and study them through time and had to look back into deep time. He got his PhD in Utah, University of Utah, and then in 2005, became a professor at Idaho State University in Pocatello. Uh, Subsequently, he became the head of the Idaho Natural History Museum, which is why we got the backroom tour. The uh, LEAF has published over 40 papers in 20 years of research, studying ancient reefs in Sweden, Canada, Utah, Africa, and fossil sharks from Idaho, from Soda Springs, which was his first talk which I understand there may even be a tie-in tonight. There will be a tie-in. <laughs> uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Dean Campanella. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike, you might just mention that uh, people who are visiting or watching this on Zoom, if they want to uh, ask questions, they should uh, sorry, use the chat. Yes, I, I'm sorry, I, I forgot about the other half the uh, Zoom audience for questions, put them in the chat to Mike Adler and Mike will ask your question at the end of the talk when the audience is here is also asking their questions and you should have time to get all of your questions answered. Thanks for reminding me, Mike. All right, well, uh, good evening to all the folks here in, in this room and, and out there in the Zoom sphere. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to speak to this group again. Uh, I, I really enjoy coming out to Jackson. Uh, today's talk is, uh, is the first time I'm giving this talk. And so if it feels a little rough around the edges, that's because I'm learning how to deliver a, a talk about something that um, is really big in scale. And uh, I, I hope to uh, take you along for a, a bit of a story that maybe you'll agree with my interpretations. And maybe, I hope, you will learn to love your fellow sponge. Um, sponges are hard to love. Uh, they are the simplest animals that we have. They are cell grade. They don't even make tissues or organs. Um, but with that simplicity, comes a lot of uh, flexibility in how a sponge can live. Sponges live in marine water environments. They can live in freshwater environments as well. But they are simple groups, aggregates of cells that work together, do different jobs for each other, and are genetically related enough that they can cooperate and serve as functions. All sponges are, like I said, pretty simple organisms that are fundamentally uh, water pumps. They pump water and extract organic goop that is floating in the water that they consume, derive energy from, and they just do that. That's their life. And you can stick a sponge in a blender and break up all the cells and throw them out into the environment. And now you have a hundred baby sponges, which is a pretty cool trick that you can't do with a human, right? So if you wanna look down your nose on a sponge, I you know, that's fine. But uh, they've been around longer than we have. Uh, they've, they are almost certainly the first animals that evolved maybe around 700 million years ago. They're pushing that, that boundary back uh, with, with chemical paleontology. It's probably in the upper 600 million years ago, we've got sponges. They're the first ones, the first animals to come on board, and they are prolific. 
they make horrible fossils. They really make horrible fossils unless they make skeletons that are durable. And the story today is about loving your sponge by recognizing what the heck a fossil sponge might look like. And we're going to dig into that. The title of the talk is Nice Chert because if, if you've ever heard a dorky geology joke, right, is uh, I think they even have t-shirts that have nice, right, the, the rock type, nice chert, right. And uh, I'm going to talk to you and hopefully convince you that we have in our region extensive preservation of what I'm going to call glass meadows. These are uh, fields of marine sponges that are preserved in Demdar Hills of the Phosphorus Sea. And I'm going to describe all of those things for you tonight. All right, let's see if I'll get my slides working. There we go. To do this, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a time period long ago, right, about 275 million years ago, the Permian time period, which is at the end of the Paleozoic era. During that time, I think most folks have a, a recognition that all of the continents plates were pretty much all together uh, forming Pangaea, right? So we know that term. And uh, the Western part of North America where we are is the Western, coast. And, and right now in Jackson, you would be bathed in water right now. Uh, you'd be maybe uh, 10 degrees, 14 degrees north of the equator. It'd be, you would assume on land, it would be pretty darn hot, tropical. In the ocean, maybe you might assume it's warm as well, right? Because we're in the tropics. Um, so we are on the west coast during this time period. And I've pointed a little arrow uh, at this little, uh, well, not little, it's actually quite a large bay that cuts inland. You can see at the end of that arrow, and that's the Phosphorus Sea. It's, a, it's an embayment of the western or the ocean to the west of us that comes in shallow onto the continent. And it's that Phosphorus Sea where a lot of interesting things took place. If you were to go swimming, in that ocean, that body of water back 275 million years ago, it might look like something like this. This is an artist rendition, of course, where of course all of the animals happen to be in the same picture hanging out together. And in the foreground, you might see on the far left in red, those are crinoids, sea lilies that are um, supported off the seafloor. And there's probably bryozoan animals in there and there's corals in there. I can see a trilobite in the middle screen on the bottom hanging out. And then swimming uh, in the foreground, you can see a coiled cephalopod with armor, you know, shell, uh, something like a nautiloid or not modern nautilus, not too different from those kinds of animals. And then hopefully you can see uh, swimming up at the surface at a safe distance is a helicoprion buzzsaw shark swimming uh, just above us, which is the world's largest at this time, largest predatory animal, 35 foot in length. I've talked to this group before, and I've done eight years of research on this particular beastie, the buzzsaw shark. Uh, Helicoprion is the technical name, and it was in National Geographic in 2019. Woohoo! We made it. Um, the Phosphoria Formation and the Phosphoria Sea is known for many things, and this is one of them. It's becoming more known for this bizarre animal with a spiral set of teeth in its lower jaw and uh, maybe some year in the future, I could give another talk on this animal. It's, it's a really spectacular story about this, this beast that lives in this ocean and around the world, but nowhere else do we find it more than in the Phosphoria Sea. Okay? So that's one thing we know about the Phosphoria Sea. There's big sharks in it. Okay? can support the life of a very large predator. We'll come back to that notion later. This is what one of those fossils looked like, by the way, uh, in the mining area in the southeast corner of Idaho in Soda Springs today. This is one of those fossils uh, that was found in a mine. And just after this picture was taken, the miners scraped this thing off into a truck and broke it apart. And it's probably now located somewhere in a cornfield in Iowa as fertilizer, which is where all sharks ought to go, right? This is really what the Phosphoria Formation is known for, right? Over a hundred years of not only recognizing that there are phosphate rocks there, but of exploiting them, of digging them out of the ground for phosphorus. Phosphorus is a rare material in earth rocks, right? 
In igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks, we have a mineral called apatite. It's a green rod-shaped mineral that we could mine phosphate for. But more commonly, it's mined out of sedimentary phosphate. And the phosphate district, the Western phosphate uh, district that we have in the Phosphoria Formation, is somewhere number two or number three largest phosphate deposits, sedimentary phosphate deposits in the world. It is exceptional. Phosphate deposits are rare. We have one of the biggest ones. And we use it, of course, we dig it up and turn it into phosphorus, which goes into fertilizer, right? Plants love it. And you can also make explosives out of phosphorus, right? The match head, the red part of a match head is phosphorus. Okay, and it almost certainly came out of Soda Springs. So this is what uh, the phosphoria formation means to a lot of folks. And geologists have not surprisingly spent an awful lot of time measuring sections, understanding the rocks of the phosphoria formation because there's money to be made out of the phosphate rocks, right? Makes sense. Well, that phosphoria C has many mysteries in it. The chemistry that gives us the phosphate rocks that are so rare as a sedimentary deposit, and the reason why we have this 100 year mining history is because something strange is going on in that embayment of the Phosphoria Sea to give us this deposit of phosphate rocks. It is weird. How weird is it? Well, it's weird. <laughs> this is, uh, this is a, a schematic. This is one of my students, uh, um, I don't know, drawings after Carol et al's 1998 map showing different environments uh, that outline where the Phosphoria Sea is and shows the modern state boundaries. So we can get a feel for the size and shape and distribution of, of this basin, this, again, this embayment into, uh, into the West. And so um, you can hopefully see above the word Phosphoria, there's Pocatello, that's where I live. And the mines where they get the rich phosphate, mineable quantities of phosphate, are located in Pocatello eastward to Soda Springs, which isn't on the map, but it heads towards the eastern um, border between Idaho and Wyoming. Up here in Jackson, you can find the Phosphoria Formation as well, right? Uh, and you're getting closer maybe to shallower water, right? And as we get into Montana, we get into that dotted pattern. That's where we find sands. We're, we feel like we're getting closer to the shore there in, in Montana. If I head south into Utah, a lot of it's not actually exposed except maybe in the, the eastern part of Utah. And the, the northeastern part of Nevada has uh, outcroppings also the, of the Phosphoria Formation. So that uh, horizontal crosshatch pattern, that horizontal pattern represents really where the main, um, I don't know, I hesitate to say deep water because I don't think it ever gets really deep, but that's the, the more of the central region of the bullseye pattern of this, um, of this basin. Okay. So that gives you a sense of scale of the Phosphoria C. Uh, if, if I, I'm not going to dwell on this slide, but this slide shows you a little bit about the stratigraphy, the names of rocks that we give within the Phosphoria, and it shows them through time. So on the vertical scale, we have time going from 274 million years ago-ish up to 260 million years ago towards the near the top, right? We have a good age control on the 260. There's an ash deposit out uh, in the sublet range of Idaho where an ash date has been recovered. And so we've got somewhere around 14 million years plus, or, you know, probably a little more than that of deposition during the Phosphoria formation. I've highlighted in red in the two places here in the Teton region where we have uh, shirts. So, Everybody knows the Phosphoria formation because it has phosphate rocks. That's what we dig up. But the phosphate rocks make up a small bulk of the actual thickness of the Phosphoria formation itself, right? It's where the money is, that's where the attention is, but the bulk of that sediment is not all phosphate. Most of it is carbonate rocks, dolomites and limestone. And about half of it, depending where you are, half of it, is chert, right? The overall thickness of the Phosphoria Formation, most places around 60 meters thick, okay? So if I do the math, 
Phosphoria is about 60 meters thick and it represents at least 14 million years. That means four meters of that rock on average, just average, four meters of that rock, 12 feet of that rock, right? Is a million years worth of time. That's from here to the ceiling, probably a 12 foot ceiling, right? There about. That is an exceedingly slow accumulation rate of sediments in a marine environment. It is extremely slow. I'm used to studying and working in carbonate, purely limestone environments where animals and other organisms are producing limestone at a rate to make 12 feet of carbonate might take 100,000 years, not a million years, right? This is one tenth as slow as a typical limestone environment. This tells us that the accumulation rate is slow, which means probably the basin itself is not sinking very fast to allow sediment to fill in. It also suggests that sediment is not flooding in from a delta coming offshore from, uh, from Nebraska westward into us, right? So there isn't delivery of a lot of sediment coming into this environment. And critters themselves are probably not cranking out a ton of material as well to fill up this basin. This is an accumulation rate that is really, really slow. And that's unusual. Go ahead. Okay, the question is for the folks in Zoom land, which units here are mineable phosphate? Um, the Mead Peak phosphatic shale member down at the bottom there between the rexes. And the retort in some places is mineable as well, tends to be thinner. In my part of the world, in, in Pocatello, Soda Springs, they're usually after the Mead Peak formation. By the way, Gila Caprian, the buzzsaw shark, it lives in the Mead Peak formation. You can find it, uh, you can find it above that as well. I think we found it in retort shale. So it occurs all the way through this interval as well. Okay. So, so is the Great Salt Lake part of the basin? Good question. So um, the Great Salt Lake, the water of the Great Salt Lake and that basin is a much, much younger basin. It's only the last, mm, let's put, uh, the, the water filling that only goes back to maybe 18,000 years. So no phosphorus. So no phosphorus in it, completely unrelated, yeah. But that's a, a good question because we have bodies of water that are kind of in time at least up on top of each other. Right? So we have a lot of this chert material and I, I, I'm gonna pause for a moment and, and talk about chert. What is chert? Does anybody know what that word really means to a geologist? What's chert? You can make arrowheads out of it. SiO2, I heard SiO2, it's silica, it's quartz. It's a rock made of quartz, the mineral quartz, which is silicon dioxide, two oxygens, one silicon, okay? And the thing about shirt that makes it somewhat special, there's many things that make it special, it's made out of tiny microscopic crystals of quartz, micro, really tiny. We call it microcrystalline quartz. And uh, I'll show some pictures of it in a second. Uh, it's a very hard material. It's very resistant, like all quartz materials, they, they tend to stick around for a long period of time. And chert is, um, you, can, you can smack it and it'll break like glass. It'll hold a very, very, very sharp edge. And so people have used it to make arrowheads, right? So it's, it's a nice material to make um, tools. It can be made of sponge spicules. I'll get to that. Absolutely. That's a big connection. You got it. Now here's a strapping young lad. Uh, so I've been working on the shark, right? I've been working uh, maybe at that point, maybe five years or six years on the helicoprion sharks of the Phosphoria formation. And that's where my mind was at, is trying to understand that animal and whatever. And uh, I had a student who wanted to work with me and I decided, hey, well, let's, let's explore the Phosphoria. I understand that, uh, you know, out in the Jackson area, there's phosphoria out there. Why don't we craft a project that could get us working in the Tetons, looking at the phosphoria formation? Because, you know, we started reading the literature and there wasn't a whole lot written about the fossils in this region. There's old papers like from the 60s, but nothing recent. So let's get a student out there measuring some sections, looking at some rocks, making some observations. We had some maybe loose ideas of what we were going to do, but really it literally was a fishing expedition 
of send a student out onto rocks, measure, make some observations, see what you see, and maybe we'll find something we didn't even know what to look for, right? And honestly, I hate to admit it, but a lot of my science works that way, is just go out there and find what you find and then see what, let the story come to you, right? Okay, so I sent Will out there and maybe we'll find a shark. That was part of back in my head. We never did actually. Okay, so I sent Will out there and uh, he went to a few places in the region, Ski Lake up uh, Teton Pass area, right? And uh, we've got Flat Creek, Grovant Slide, we've got Crystal Creek. He had a number of local localities that he went to. Uh, I went, oriented him on the rocks. He got his own vehicle. He went out and started making observations on his own, a good independent kind of master student. And uh, he goes out there and he sees stuff like this. This is uh, an outcrop. At this it says Crystal Creek. Um, this is one of his measured sections. It's about 60 meters or so. So thick, right? And no matter what's all in that in that vertical section, but he got to the top of the section, and there's this black rock. Hopefully, you can see it's kind of a dark black rock. That's all chert. That's the upper chert, probably the Tosi chert. Okay, that's the name it's been given, and it's it's messy. It's really messy. It's hard to understand what the heck is going on in chert rock. They they're black. They weather in a really strange way. They're kind of nasty until you bring them home and make thin sections in them. Uh, but maybe you can see there's a little bit of something going on, maybe uh, two thirds of the way up this hill, you can see some wiggliness. Let's just say there's some wiggliness going on. And if you kind of get up close to it and put a rock hammer next to it for scale, there's some organized wiggliness to it. There are tubes that are moving up from bottom right to top left in that direction, and they're all more or less parallel to each other, and they're all next to each other. So it's a bunch of fat spaghettis all racing up the hill. That's what it kind of looks like. And the first outcrop that he brought me to after he'd been spending a little time out in the field, he brought me out there and he said, Leif, what is going on? I have no idea what this is. And I said, I've seen this before. I know what this is. So now we're going to take a very hard tangent and we're gonna step back a few more years in time to a project that I started in 2007, a number of years earlier, almost a decade earlier. And uh, I presented this at GSA, uh, regional GSA meeting in, in Orem, Utah. And, uh, and it's dealing with a different time period, but a similar problem. And you'll see how the two connect in a moment. Here's uh, what Fields Camp students look like at Idaho State. Some of them brave, uh, not wearing a shirt in the high altitude of Idaho's mountains, and uh, this guy had like such a brutal sunburn after that. So, you know, students are gonna be students. But this is in 2007, 2008, and we're out in uh, just some wonderful part of the country. This is in central Idaho, uh, the Lost River Range. That's where Bora Peak is, the tall, tallest peak in Idaho. And uh, it's carbonates, as far as you can see, limestones. And I feel really at home in limestones, right? I've talked about limestones depositing relatively rapidly compared to certainly what we find in the Phosphoria. These are really thick bedded limestones that behave the way limestones should. They're big and thick. Uh, the carbonate, this is part of a carbonate bank system where the basin is dropping rapidly and carbonate is being produced as fast as the basin will accept more. And the, and the animals are making carbonate as part of their shells. The algae is making carbonate as part of their shells. And the, what we call the carbonate factory is making lots of carbonate sediment and feeding the limestones that build up and make these deposits, really enormous packages of limestone, okay? That's what we find in the middle part of, of Idaho. This is also in a marine environment, the West Coast. This is, yeah, this is definitely a marine environment. Uh, think Bahamas, nice. Uh, maybe you have a cocktail in your hand and off the shore, this is what's actually happening is, is uh, uh, the shells are being made and thickness of limestone is accruing. It's wonderful stuff. Okay, so this is the marine environment we have recorded in Idaho of the Mississippian time period. Uh, formation names in case people are uh, tuned into these kinds of rocks. The Arco Hills Formation is what I'm going to show you. 
and this is kind of in the later part of the Mississippian, life is good in the Mississippian, carbonates are being produced rapidly. And I have a student in my field camp who comes to me at the end of the day, and she took a photograph of this. And she says to me, uh, is that a fossil? Which every student asks me, is this a fossil? And I hate to say it, but like sometimes they're not. And I have to break it to the student. No, nah, it's not, it's not a fossil, but good on you for looking. That's what I always say, right? Because I'm, I'm trying to you know, build them up. But I said immediately, knee jerk. I said, nah, it's a concretion. It's a concretion. What's a concretion? Concretion is something that a paleontologist says you have if they think you don't have a fossil. <laughs> And I'm being sort of facetious, but also a little honest. A concretion is an organic shaped blob, usually of chert, right? Or some hard material, some maybe, uh, well, often chert, uh, that grows after the sediment has already been laid down. And it happens in the, in the subsurface of the ground. As, the, as, the, um, as your sedimentary rock is graduating from being a sediment to a sedimentary rock, the grains of sediment get cemented together. And sometimes the cements glom on around something and grow in a, uh, they nucleate and grow outward from that point and make this organic blobby football shaped structure, right? And, and they tend to weather out as blobs and people pick them up and they, you know, blobby things kind of have an organic shape, makes you think it might be a fossil. And so a lot of the time, concretions are just noise. They get in the way. They confuse you, right? So I said, knee jerk, because I'm trained and learned. I say, nah, that's a concretion. And why do we dismiss chert? Because as a boy or a girl, you are taught by your paleontologist or your sedimentologist that we should dismiss chert. Why? Because shirt is a secondary precipitation that happens after the burial of my rocks. And they aren't telling me about the sediments or the fossils that are existing in the rock at that time. They are telling me about some process that happened after deposition, which might be important to you for some other reason, but it's not telling you about the organisms that are alive on the seafloor, okay? So shirt is secondary, not primary. Concretions are noise, you should ignore them. And that paradigm is generally, you know, reasonable advice. But I would su suggest that the reason this whole story is happening right now today and didn't happen 60 years ago is because of this paradigm. And because there's a knee-jerk response that when you see chert and when you see nodules of it, you should dismiss it as being secondary noise and not primary. Because most of the time it probably is, but sometimes maybe it's not. Let's look at more of these. The student, uh, Valentina was her name. She found this one and she took me out there the next day and I looked and I said, oh, that's kind of interesting, a bullseye pattern. Well, that's kind of cool. And then we looked over and then, oh shoot, there's another one. Okay, we're seeing actually, and this one's got like three rings and some weird thing in the middle. Rock hammer is about 30 centimeters or so in size. Here's another one, it's not really well preserved, but you see in this ring shaped stuff, and the raised parts are chert. The lower stuff that's gray is limestone. And so the chert has a tendency to weather in positive relief because it's more resistant. And so here's a, like three of them I can see on this picture. Now, those were on bedding planes in vertical view. This is, in, this is actually a vertical. I'm looking at a, a stack of limestone and I see like almost two meters of this thing going up. Whoa, okay, that's kind of weird. And here's one that's kind of looks deformed. That's weird. Here's two of them on their side, horizontal. Maybe you can see them. Okay, it takes a little creativity or imagination to see them. But once you see them, you start tuning in to this like shirt blobs that have, there's some order to them. There's some pattern to them. They all have kind of similar sizes. Here's one, two, three, four of them. So what do we do? We see things in the field. We're not quite sure what the heck they are. We bring some back to the lab. We cut them up with a saw. We make thin sections out of them and we try to understand them. Those rings go into the rock, okay? And they go through the rock and there's a cross section. Here's a little quick little map of it. And you can probably tell where I'm going with this. The 
some of the bands record sediment and you can actually see layers of sediment. And some of the bands have a clotted fabric of carbonate. Uh, and some of them, when you go into thin section, I think I have a picture, maybe I don't have a picture. Uh, maybe it's coming up next. You can actually see little spicules. I'll show the spicules in a second. I had another student that started measuring them. Uh, you know, most of them are vertical, right? About half of them are vertical to oblique. A few of them are actually on their sides horizontal. They range in size from 40 to 54. If we look at those, those rings, some of them have two rings, some have three, some only have one. Weird, really strange thing. In thin section, sorry for this really bright slide, um, all those little hairs that are running through there, those are spicules. What's a spicule? Well, a spicule is the body part that a sponge makes. They look like little darning needles. They are microscopic little needles of opaline silica. Silica, I think everybody's good with that, SiO2. Opal silica has a little water attached to the silica. Okay, So that's what sponges make. A certain kind of modern sponge, like the demo sponges, those are the squishy ones. If you've ever seen a squishy sponge, right? We think of the squishy, spongy part, but supporting all that squishy sponge are thousands of little needles of, <laughs> of opaline silica. And that will stick in your hand. If you ever pick up like a modern live sponge and squish it with your hand, they are protected by that stuff. And you'll have a handful of needles. So don't do it. <laughs> it's a protection, right? So if like a fish takes a big chomp of it, it gets a face full of needles. No one wants to eat a sponge. So this is what we find in those rocks. We find spicular chert, lots of little spicules, body parts of sponges. And we find it in certain parts of those rings. We don't find it in the outer rings, only in the central core. It's really interesting. Here's a zoom in on one spicule where it actually branches and makes a threefold, a, um, a three-part uh, split at the end. That's actually fairly rare. Most of them actually end in single point. So we find spicules, we find all sorts of weird diagenesis going on of dolomite growing in there and calcite. And you can still see the ghosts of spicules in that chert in thin section. So there's a lot going on in these, um, in these tubular structures, shall we say. And one of the things that happens with opaline silica, the, the, the material that the spicules are made of, Opaline silica is not stable over time. Opaline silica wants to become chert. And to graduate becoming chert, it actually dissolves and can remobilize and move out and then become chert. And so this is what happens with spicules is they have a tendency to dissolve and reform elsewhere as chert. So what we see is these bands, perhaps the fossil itself, the spicule producing sponge is in the center of this cylinder. And as those spicules dissolve and re-precipitate, they re-precipitate a band some distance away from the central core, and then another band of chert some distance away. And we get two to three rings of this in a carbonate setting. So are concretion sponges? Not necessarily, but sponges can create concretions around themselves. That's what this example shows. And we have lots of examples of this in that Mississippian outcrop, um, 144 different uh, of these cylindrical weird uh, sponges. Again, bedding plane, lots of them. They're overcoated with moss in this thing. We also find them in sandstones in that environment. So not pure carbonate, but we find them in sandstones. Here's one, and you can see deflected laminae around the base of it, which could be from loading. So that could be post-depositional, or it could actually be sediment lapping up against and deflecting around uh, a, an actual physical structure, a sponge in that sandstone as the sandstone is being laid down. And you see those deflections there. Here's another one that's in horizontal, so it's presumably toppled over and sediment is lapping up and over it, right? You can see deflection of lamination. All of this to say that these structures, these cylinders that I'm finding in the Mississippian are cueing me in to a body fossil actually being there at the time of sedimentation, and that these are not just concretions that form secondarily after sediments already been deposited and underground. These aren't just concretions that are inorganic. These are actually fossils. Okay? And there are other fossils that are associated with them. These are some brachiopods. We get lots of crinoids associated with them, which allows us to place them into a, an environment in which they were growing. 
somewhere a little offshore in slightly deeper water. In sedimentology, we think about the fair weather wave base and storm weather wave base. That's how far the waves get during fair weather versus storm weather. We think we're probably somewhere around storm wave base. Uh, that might be 40 meters, 50 meters of water depth. So they're not super shallow, but they're not the bottom of the ocean either, right? Somewhere in between. We can't really, really refine any better than that, but somewhere offshore. Yeah, question. These are all found, these sponges uh, are found in the Mississippian rocks of central Idaho, Lost River Range. Okay. I am about to make the pivot back to the phosphoria. So that's my experience from 2007, 2008, and 2009. I presented on it. And, and then I got this big sidetrack called the buzzsaw shark. <laughs> and that took me away from actually even writing that thing up. So that hasn't been published yet though I did present on it in GSA. Now you might ask, what do sponges do in the modern environment? Are there places where you can find sponges growing on the seafloor en masse in tubular shape? And the answer is good question. I'm glad you asked. Um, we can go to places like uh, off the coast of BC uh, and find these tubular guys growing off the seafloor there, Fraser Ridge, one place. Sea mounts off Canary Island. These are fairly deep, deep water. You get a whole bunch of sponges and they are dominating the seafloor. No carbonate producers around them. Even more interesting, if you go off uh, the Antarctic coastline in really, truly cold water, guess who's growing down there? The silica producing sponges. They're happy. That's where silica is happy. Cold water. Cold water. Why? Because silica precipitates and likes to be a solid in cold water. In warm water, silica likes to dissolve. Just the opposite for carbonates. If I'm, a, if I'm a clam and I make a shell out of carbonate, I like warm water to make that, right? If I'm a coral, same thing, warm water. Carbonate dis dissolves in cold water. Just the opposites, right? Okay. Have we seen upright columnar uh, sponges in the fossil record elsewhere? Absolutely. In fact, in my early history, I used to study Ordovician, 480 million year old rocks. And in those rocks, you can find a type of sponge called stromatoporoids that make a carbonate skeleton that is like tree trunks. And you can find vertical tree trunks in place in the sediment. Sometimes they're toppled over. So my mind is already like front loaded with these ideas because of my experiences in seeing a bunch of different rocks and different kinds of fossils. And and truly loving my sponge. So I'm already sort of um, maybe uh, uh, on, on the way to um, believing in the sponge. So this was my old drawing back in the 2009. I, I don't think the actual animal sponge is, is, is ring-shaped. I think it's actually just the central column, that's it. And everything outward of that are these shirt banding uh, concretions that form because the silica that the animal is making is diffusing away from it and certifying at different bands away from it, okay? There's gotta be a bottom to them. In some places we can actually see um, a really blobby uh, outline. There was maybe one picture in there, I should have highlighted it, where it looks like multiples are coming out of one base. That was kind of my interpretation at the time. And I, Kind of think that's it's plausible. I don't know if for sure, for sure, but plausible. Okay, this was my timid conclusions at the time, back in 2009. Is I think those Mississippian ones in Idaho that I'm finding in central Idaho are 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 actual organic bodies, syndepositional, meaning they are happening at the same time that the sediment is being laid down, and that truly they are sponges that are being preserved. Okay. And at the time, I felt really nervous about it. Why? Because I'm a professor who tells students that their concretions are not fossils. Thank you very much, right? And so I really had to change my opinion on this and it did cause a little bit of grief. So snap back to when my student shows me this and the first thing out of my mouth is, you got sponges, right? I'm converted, these are sponges. At least that's my hypothesis. So what do we observe in the field? We've seen in all of his localities where he looked at the phosphoria and ran into charts, especially thick bedded charts, they've got wormy things in them. parallel macaroni growing vertically to the sky. Um, 
they're hard to photograph. They are notoriously difficult to photograph from a distance because Chert just doesn't like to photograph well. Um, but hopefully on that blue hammer on the left, you can see some tubes to the left a bit running up in, in kind of an upward left direction. At Flat Creek, um, there's a whole stack of parallel lines that are kind of going 45 degrees to the top left of the image. Those are all tubes that are running parallel to each other, shoulder to shoulder. They are really packed in there. Here's an oblique transverse cut through them. And you can see how closely packed those tubes, right? We're cutting across the tops of them or right through the middles rather of them. And you can see that um, oh, our scale bar on the right there has centimeters. I don't, know, I don't even know what that is. Those aren't, those that's a scaled thing. Oh, right, the whole, the whole distance there is 10 centimeters. So they're, you know, in, I don't know, between an inch and three inches in diameter typically, but they are close packed in together, really close packed in together. Sometimes you can see the base of them on the one on the far right, you can see deflection of sediment around it. And then you've got a base of one. Tops of them are really hard to find. Um, there's a bottom there, maybe a top there. It's hard to say. Okay. Now, yes. Ah, I'll show I'll show you a thin section. The question is, is the is the whole thing the animal or is it just the tube? What part of that is actually sponge, do I think? I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. I, I've got some thin sections to show on that. Now, these tubes are so obvious to anybody that walks up on these outcrops that every single person who has ever measured a section or made observations of these rocks have recognized them and have called them something like cylindrical chert, tubular chert, columnar chert, or something. Everybody has seen these that has really studied these rocks. I'm not the first person and Will's not the first person to see these, okay? There's a paper from 1998 that saw these and they said, I think these are burrows. These, these are vertical tubes of a burrowing animal. And what you're seeing is the filled in sediment inside a bunch of burrows. And so they gave a name, trace, I'm a trace fossil person as well. Uh, trace fossil people give names to their trace fossils. So scolithos is the common name for a vertical burrow structure. And grandis, meaning the large one, they named a new ichna species, right? And so, um, the problem with these being burrows is how tightly packed they are and how wide they are. There's almost no room for sediment, right? So burrows are in sediment. You have to burrow into something. A burrow is a hole in something else. And there's no, it seems impossible in my mind, how you could have so many holes without any sediment between them. That's kind of a problem. And how does that stay open and yada, yada, yada. There's a lot of problems with the burrow idea, but you know, it was, it's a, thought that was put out there. We have lots and lots of occurrences of this. This is at Ski Lake where they're white in a um, darker matrix. Sometimes they're dark in a lighter matrix, but it's the same deal. Chert tubes that uh, run up vertically. We see lots of evidence of spicules throughout this. And again, anybody who studied the Phosphoria formation knows that chert in this area, when you look at cherts in thin section, you see spicules. You see all those little hair-like needles running through it. So it's been no surprise to anybody ever that there are sponges around the phosphoria. Oh, the little white pieces are really bright. They're, they're super, uh, well, you can see through them pretty easily. Those are little silt grains of quartz, okay? Silt sized grains of quartz that are running through there. One of them even looks like it's hexagonal. Now, here's, uh, here's an example of, of one of these and some thin sections that go along with, with what we're seeing in outcrop. So if you take that nice uh, white circle, that's a tube, right, in cross section. If you go right in the middle of it, that right hand uh, slide shows a lot of spicules. So when you look in the middle of these things, they're just chock-a-block with spicules. If you go to the outer margin, there's a little band around them. Sometimes that might be of carbonate. Sometimes it's of chert. Usually it's of a different color. It doesn't have any spicules. Instead, what you can probably see a whole bunch of parallel lines in there. That's actually cleavage of dolomite or, or calcite. I'm not sure if it's calcite or dolomite in this one, but those are carbonate cleavages. There's actually no spicules in that zone. 
And then if we go to the um, interstitial space, that lighter brown tan area, um, we've got lots of sediment and almost no spicules in there. And that's the pattern you'd expect to see if you had body fossil of a sponge and then adjacent spaces where, you know, it's just the sediment around them. So I won't belabor this point. We're, we feel pretty confident that these structures aren't burrows, and there's a variety of reasons why we think that. Whereas we think there's lots of evidence to suggest that there are spicules in place, and uh, we have a relatively tight range of sizes that we see. It's a repeatable thing uh, that suggests that we have uh, solidified sponges in our, our location. And of course, the example from the Mississippian is good corroborating evidence, but not direct evidence. And we do have some other sponges that have been described from the Phosphoria. So it's not uh, surprising to anybody that there would be spicules or sponges in there. Some of these will find that they're actually aligned with each other in different beds at different orientations. There was a paper that was written back in, the, uh, in 1990 that tried to use the orientation of these cylinders as evidence for compression and shear associated with mountain building events much later. Uh, and, and that's all plausible. It doesn't really change the story at all. Um, but they never gave an example or gave a, they never gave a, an, an origin of what those cylinders were. They just said, well, we've got cylinders and they're oriented. So we're going to use the orientation to tell us about structural geology. And they kind of punted on what those cylinders actually are. So the life and preservation of this is very, very speculative at this point. We think that we've got vertical tubes. We don't think that those animals actually were sitting above the seafloor two or three feet. We think they're actually probably maybe a few inches or a foot at most above the seafloor, and they were gradually getting buried as they grew upward. And so um, their burial, while they're growing, or at least rapidly after they uh, have grown, is part of the story of why they're getting preserved in the first place. We think they're getting entombed more or less as they're growing along. And there's some deformation in them. This is one of them that you can see this kink going off to the side. Whether that's happening while they're, you know, just very shallowly buried, or if that's happening much later in the rock record, we honestly don't know. But since we found this in four different locations in the Tetons, it begs the question, are there more of them, right? Are they anywhere else? And unbeknownst to me at the time that Will had started his thesis, my colleague at the University of Utah, some of you have met her and she's spoken to you guys, Kathleen Ritterbush, uh, had a master's student who was doing a similar uh, kind of exploratory uh, master's student working out in Nevada and Utah on the similar rocks. And guess what? They're finding the same thing. She wound up having a PhD student, Zach here, figured, uh, and I was on his committee. And uh, these are some of the things they found out in Northwestern Utah and, and in Nevada. This is the Pigeon Mountains. And here's some chert of the Phosphoria. It kind of looks like ours, this kind of black, awful stuff to work with. But when you go in the thin section, you can find spicules. Sometimes they have three-pointed uh, terminations to them. And there's some tubes on the far right. They're finding them there. The morphology, the shape of their tubes are a little different than ours. That's not a big deal. I'd expect lots of different species and growth forms of sponges to be in this, in this zone. Um, they have some, some pretty nice ones that are like tubular. They're fairly parallel cylindrical kinds. They have conical ones, conical ones that actually bud and branch, which is kind of cool. And they have some fatter ones that are, you know, wider and stouter, more vase shaped as they call them. When they make cuts through theirs, they find a similar pattern that we do. The central core is full of spicules. And as you go out to the outer bands, not so much. So coming back to your question, how much of this is actually sponge? The central portion is sponge, kind of like the Mississippian ones. I think you have the sponge body itself, and then you have reaction rims of chert deposition where you have the silica of the, of the spicules migrating outward and certifying, certifying just right outside of the margin of the body of the animal. And that's probably happening in the sediment surface or uh, j just after it's getting buried. So they have great examples of this kind of the same process that we have up here in Wyoming. And so, uh, you know, he came up with 
he was doing a, a, a more broader study on all the different shirt faces that he comes across, but this becomes one of the faces that he recognized and he thinks, oh, I've got some sponge meadows here in Nevada and Utah. And so we started talking together and, um, and, and trying to piece together where these guys might be living on the, uh, along the water depth. And kind of like our Mississippian example, we think they're in not the shallowest water, but not in super deep water either. They're somewhere in between, probably getting buried slowly as they're growing along. So what's the motion? What's that? Uh, hmm. They're not reproducing. They're not, are they multiplying? Well, they might be budding. They might. Uh, so some sponges, you'll find that they have a, a general tube morphology, and then they will they will branch offward. They'll split out. Um, I don't know the way of the sponge that well. <laughs> they do. Uh, I'm 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 thinking. Okay, so if I go to another group of fairly simple animals like the corals. Uh, they'll have branch shapes to their colonies as well. Um, well, so for our sponges, hmm, you can get fairly, I don't know, intricate shape is maybe overstepping my bounds here with sponges. Usually their shapes are pretty darn simple blobs, right? Or simple tubes. Branching is not really uncalled for in, in modern ones, but I don't know. Oh, that's splitting out. In that case, possible, but maybe I don't think is likely. Just because in three dimensions, you can see that branch actually come out. And it's, it's like a cylinder off a cylinder. And it doesn't show compaction that I would expect to see, I think, in that case. Good. Yeah. Yes. The question is uh, relating to the color that we see in the chert and the darkness of it or the lightness of it. Is there anything that we know of that's controlling it? And the, I guess the short answer is, I don't know. There is definitely color banding that we do see and the color banding does seem to correspond to some either body of the fossil or not body of the fossil. That does seem to be the case, um, but we don't know. Probably organic content would be my hunch, but I really don't. Now, he finished that study and part of his study included going through the USGS, USGS reports from the 50s and, uh, 50s and 60s. And I mentioned that a lot of people have looked at the Phosphoria formation and measured those rocks, <clears throat> analyzed them primarily because there's economic deposits of phosphorus, right? And so there have been countless studies in this region, Montana and elsewhere, that have measured sections through our rocks. And he compiled them all and looked at them all. And with that, we can add 36 additional localities of where columnar and tubular cherts are found. This is a figure from one of those USGS reports. And boy, that looks like the things we've seen, right? Very same thing, they've got them. So we can use that legacy of information to fill out the distribution of these chert cylinders, which we think are sponges. And this is the culmination of that work. All of these pink dots and green dots are USGS occurrences of what they call tubular chert and cylindrical chert. Will and I worked on these blue dots in the area right here. And then Kathleen and her student Zach worked on the Nevada Utah line. And so if you put them all together, I've also got little black dots. The little ants represent uh, stratigraphic sections where no cylindrical cherts or tubular cherts were found. So those are negatives, right? So we've got a lot of negatives, but we've got a whole lot of positives. And we find them all around. They don't make a perfect semicircle of the basin, right? But they do, they're probably environmentally constrained of, of water depth or whatever along here. And so if you go from Nevada all the way around up north to the Montana Northern location, that spans 630 kilometers. The whole basin, 630 kilometers, just to put in scale, the Great Barrier Reef today is a little over 2000 kilometers. This is about a third the size of the Great Barrier Reef. And it's a whole system of sponges growing quite happily 
on the seafloor. When we look at it in stratigraphic temporal context over time, we're seeing that in a variety of places, we have recurring, uh, re we have recurrence of these sponges over and over in, in, in the church up through the sequence. So it's not one instance here or there, it's a recurring in interval throughout this basin. This is happening many times over, right? This is what we call our sponge meadows, okay? They're probably not growing super high off the seafloor. If you were scuba diving over them, they would look like those pictures I showed of, of the Weddell Sea in Antarctica, little cute little tubes sitting on the surface, but you could swim for 600 kilometers and probably see them for a continuous belt. Pretty impressive. And that's happening right in our backyard here. What's even more cool is that this is happening during a time period where all of the northwestern coastline from here all the way up to Arctic Canada, Arctic uh, uh, Norway and Scandinavia, if you have Permian age rocks, they kind of look like the ones here, lots of chert. In fact, it's been called the Permian chert event. And there's a chunk of time where chert is the, is the bee's knees. Like everybody's making chert along our Northwest coast. And people have thought very hard about why that might be. Why is that Permian chert event happening? And uh, one idea that's probably a decent one is there's, uh, there's some glaciation happening up far north and cold water is getting pumped down our northwest coast and upwelling deep water that's nutrient rich. So upwelling brings cold water to the surface and you have cold water coming from the, um, uh, from the north, driving this pump of nutrients that is feeding food for our sponges, which love to eat nutrients. They're just organic pumps. And it's cooling the water, which is favorable for silica production as opposed to carbonate production. And that gives us a, a bigger picture. It's not really a global, pro, uh, um, a global phenomenon, but it's happening along a big swath of uh, Laurasia during this time period. And so it links, again, what we're observing here to a bigger story. So what we are contending and what we're gonna be publishing on soon is that the Phosphoria formation preserves the first and only that we know of glass factory that is like 630 kilometers long on what we call the glass ramp. I referred to before in carbonate environments, we have a carbonate ramp and a carbonate factory where all the carbonates are made and shed out into the basin. It's the same idea, except it's silica this time. And we have a silica rich environment uh, where our glass factory of sponges is cranking out the silica that is making all of this chert that we find in the Phosphoria formation. So just to kind of quickly summarize, the position on the ramp almost certainly has something to do not only with the growth of these critters, but also the burial and preservation of them and why we're capturing them in the first place. Second, you know, there are a number of reasons why this may be, but it's, it's high time that we start recognizing cylindrical chert as sponges and, and tuning our eyes into it. And I would bet dollars to donuts that as soon as people start recognizing and, and thinking more critically about their cherts and their concretions, we may find out that there are a whole lot more of these in the environment than has ever been recognized. The fact to me that the USGS had been out there mapping this in the 50s and 60s, and these are smart people, right? There is no secret that there are cylindrical cherts out there. We've been seeing them for decades. It's just finally somebody saying, hey, maybe the fact that they're full of spicules means they're actually sponges. And now we've got many case studies to uh, hopefully uh, demonstrate that convincingly. All right, that's where I wanna end. This is the last picture. I think that's Mike right there in the foreground hiking somewhere. Are we on ski lake trip? Lake. We're above ski lake. That's if it hadn't rained we would have dropped into phillips canyon that sounds like a familiar statement <laughs> when you're hiking out there and john is on the right in front of us leading the way yes so thank you all and uh happy to take some questions yes sir yeah. You talked about how the sponges were sticking up and they were being buried in situ, but you also said that the depositional rate 
is extremely slow. Yeah. In, you know, I mean, a meter would take a quarter million years, and sponges don't live that way. That's exactly right. I'm glad you, I'm glad you pointed that out. Okay. So, oh, yes. Okay. So the, quest, the question is, how, there's, there's two things that seem to be at odds with each other. On one hand, I started off the talk saying that the phosphoria is a 60 meter chunk of rock that represents 14 million years and boy deposition accumulation is really slow. And then at the end of the talk, I said, well, the reason why these sponges are being preserved is they're being buried as they're, being, as they're alive. And so that seems like a paradox, right? Of how can you have rapid enough deposition during the lifetime of a sponge and sponges don't live for thousands of years, right? How can you have rapid deposition to bury critters yet at the same time have an overall slow depositional or accumulation rate of sediment? And, and this is where I'll use the weather and climate analogy, right? You can have a lot of hot and cold days, but your overall climate can be smoothed out and, and, and not really, um, the average over long time period can be slow accumulation rate. But on any given day or any given system or every any given part of an environment, you can have sedimentation rates that can be whatever they are. And so uh, the overall pattern within the basin is to not accumulate a lot. But in certain locations, and I wouldn't be surprised if this is a bit of a Goldilocks spot where you have just enough sedimentation to keep up, keep pace with the burial uh, with the growth of these sponges, which is probably not all that rapid. Um, and that's what's preserving. That's the best way I can justify it. This, that's a good question. Yeah, I would say that deposition where we have those sponges is happening on a much more rapid rate than the overall background rate of accumulation within the phosphoria. That's a fair statement. Question? Is the process that leads to the fossilization of sponges, is that process happening today? Yes, I would presume that process is happening today. So if you went, for example, if, if we could take a submersible to the Weddell Sea off Antarctica, those little sponges, those little sponges that are growing on the seafloor, I bet if you dug down, you could find likely uh, incipient, soon to be certified sponges down there. Um, I think it's totally plausible that that process is happening in certain environments on our planet right now. Uh, but they're, they're hidden. They're in places that are, one, they're kind of obscure places. They're hard to get to. And you'd also have to go, you'd really have to go looking for it in order to find it. But I, I believe that process is happening. The time frame, another uh, related issue is what, how long does that take? Right? How long is the process of going from I'm a sponge to I'm a certified sponge? That might be a thousand years. It might be two thousand years. It might be longer. I really don't have a good scale on that. We know that uh, I think experimentally, people have figured out that opaline silica converts to uh, opal CT and then converts to chert, and there is a process by which that happens. People have run that in the lab. Um, the timescales I've seen in literature are in the sort of thousands of years kind of scale. We have some oh, questions, on chat. questions on chat. Yep. I'll take a chat question. Okay. Yes. Right. Um, there was actually two questions now. Uh, the first question was, did you find sponges in the valley above Key Lake in the thick band of church across the head of the valley partway up the divide? I'm asking, I'm looking at Mike right now because no, he's very good about this. I, I found them on the other side of the uh, divide, not on the ski lake side, but the Phillip side. And when we looked through, when we walked up the section there, we didn't find the sponges. The, the best pictures were from uh, Flat Creek. I'm sorry, no, not Flat, Crystal Creek. Crystal Creek had the best. The big That's right. Three meter section of 
multiple generations of sponges. So I guess to answer your question, you probably can't hear Mike. Mike's answer. Maybe you can. Okay. If you did hear Mike, I think he said sort of a negative on on scaling. Right. We found shirt layers because the bottom of the phosphoria is bounded by a one to three meter shirt layer, but you don't, and there's spicules in it, but you don't see the sponge fossils in that bottom layer. Right. That's that where the breccia, that funky breccia of chert was, I believe. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. Okay, and there was one other question. Uh, uh, please talk again and more about which rock type the phosphate is found. Does the chert contain any phosphate? Oh, uh, okay. So where is the phosphate found in the phosphoria around here? So there are shales. I think we remember seeing a shale up uh, that was by Ski Lake. Yeah, they, they actually dug a trench to assay. The yeah. Right? There's, we're almost where we're standing. Yeah, you will find. Uh, so the phosphate units themselves are relatively thin in the Teton region uh, compared to what we get down like in the Pocatello area. Thank, Thank goodness, right? <laughs> um, so they tend to be relatively thin, but you can often find them on a hillside because somebody back in the past has dug a trench into them. They, um, they are mud rocks or shale rocks. They tend to be very black in color or dark brown in color. They weather really badly and plants, no surprise, love growing in them. And so it's very, very hard to find a natural outcropping of phosphatic rich rocks uh, in your lovely verdant uh, <laughs> vegetated part of the world. In a mining context or a rock outcrop by a roadside, you would look for a dark brown shaley or black shaley unit, probably nearby a limestone actually is probably what you'd find. They tend to be awfully thin around here though. And I guess the second part of the question was, does the church contain any phosphate? Oh, uh, does the chert contain any phosphate? You know, it wouldn't shock me to find a little bit of interbedding of, of phosphatic rich rocks in there. But generally, once you get into the chert, you're, you're in solid quartz and it's, uh, it's nonstop silica. Yeah. Oh. We'll go to the back first. <laughs> Much, yeah. Okay, so the question, just for those of you on the Zoom, uh, the question relates to sort of the geography of our of our landscape during the Permian time period, which I brought back up, uh, versus the time frame when we had a, a large seaway cutting North America in half, the Western Interior Seaway. So the Western Interior Seaway uh, is, is a feature that starts in the Mesozoic era uh, later than this. So probably starting a hundred and, hmm, I'm gonna go one, just round numbers, 150 million years ago, whereas this is 275 million years ago. Okay? So this is quite a bit older. And by the time we get the Western Interior Seaway, the, the continents had all ripped themselves apart and Pangaea is long in the rear view mirror. And now we've got our continents mostly separated out, certainly North America's by its lonesome. And that's when we get uh, that Western Interior Seaway form. Okay, so that is a much more recent phenomenon. Yes, another question. Uh, the question is, uh, is the phosphate, you, you asked about the phosphate or the? Phosphate. Yep. The, phos the phosphatic rock is mined for commercial value in Southeast Idaho and into Wyoming. Absolutely. Uh, so 
the, the two big companies are Monsanto, now owned by Bayer, and Simplot. Those are the two big consortiums that have been mining that for quite some time. Ah, so um, the other big phosphate deposits in the world, uh, the Carolinian track uh, between the, the Carolinas and Florida, there's a much younger phosphatic deposit along there that's associated with the Atlantic side. And then uh, if you go to Northwest Africa, Morocco to Mali uh, is just absolutely rich with uh, phosphatic deposits. I've worked up in Mali and the, the phosphates there are legion, but they are in the middle of the Sahara Desert. <laughs> yeah. Yes, question there. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So the question is, uh, relates back to the, the, the body of the sponge. Let's talk about the shape of the body of the sponge. And then, and then how, does, how does the body of a sponge and the, and the spicules of that sponge then become chert? Yeah. Yeah. So the best, I, I guess these are still sort of preliminary ideas, but the notion is the, the body of my sponge is, is typically tubular in shape, has a hollow center. Most sponges have a hollow chimney-like center. Water comes in from the sides and gets filtered and then pumped out the top as a chimney. That's generally how the sponges. So it cycles in, pumps out the top like a chimney. And so um, in that body, if I made a cross section through a, a modern sponge or of ancient sponge for that matter, I'd have the soft squishy spongin material and nested inside that are the little needles of, of spicules. And the spicules are made of opalized silica, so water-bearing silica. So I'm, I've got my animal, and that's what it's made of. Over time, the opaline silica, which is not stable over time, is going to start con dissolving effectively. It converts to um, opaline CT is usually what it's called. Is it cristobalite, something like that? another variation of quartz as an intermediary stage, which is also unstable. And then eventually that will also dissolve and reprecipitate, migrate probably as part of it. And then for some reason, the chemistry has to be right and it'll start precipitating out as little microscopic quartz crystals, which we call chert. And so there can be a migration that happens of the silica away from its source. In fact, that's probably very typical. That'll diffuse away. Um, that, the, 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 uh, the conversion from spicules and opaline silica to chert, the chertification process, almost certainly is happening after that animal is already buried in sediment. So now it's completely entombed in sediment. So I wouldn't think of it as a chimney at that point. There's no flow going through it. It's, it's a diffusion process, a chemical diffusion process away from the source of high concentration of silica to low concentration of silica. And then at some distance away, it will start nucleating and solidifying as chert at some distance away. Ah, the rings in the Mississippian example is it's finding this, this would require a chemist. Uh, there is some diffusion property that allows it to get to some distance, and then the concentration is right for solid precipitation of chert. And then we get a, 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 a halo, a coma, where you get no precipitation, and then you get the right microchemistry conditions for precipitation again. And we'll see that happen in the Mississippian example two, three times away from the source of silica. And that is in a pure limestone. Um, what chemistry is required in order to do that is beyond what I quite understand, but it, 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 it's a recurring phenomenon that we see in that particular deposit. Yeah, yes. Right. That's what, if you skip out of my head, I mean, there's something complex 
Yeah, the comment is that that there's there's a, likely a feedback in the chemistry, a negative feedback in the chemistry that's precluding uh, cementation for some distance, and then maybe that goes away, and then you get to a, a state where you can precipitate again. Um, it's it's one of these problems that you know. Again, I'm not trained as a chemist in that way, but you know, it, it reminds me of, uh, if you're aware of lice gang banding in, in, uh, in siliciclastic rocks, where you get that beautiful um, sandstone, where you get uh, banding of dark and light pinks and dark reds and dark browns banding, uh, we can get in the south, um, in, in uh, southern Utah in particular, kind of famous places where you get it. And you'll get these kind of ring-like bandings and that's uh, redox boundary zones of iron oxidized states. And you get really intricate patterns of banding that are related to you know, the micro conditions of chemistry at that location that favors one phase over another. I'm sure something like that is going on, but explaining it specifically, I, I can't. Pressure, temperature, and possibly fluid flow as well is, is associated with this. Well, you also said that there's chemical conformity. Yes. And so exponents are temporarily featured as stable forms of the chemical So as it gets decaying, not decaying, but as it oxidizes, the stems and the stems. So it's a chemical thing that can occur over a cell. If you're going to start off with an unstable process, it's trying to get to and in the process might migrate from its source, right? Yeah. Yeah. The we couldn't under the, we couldn't hear what that was that uh, comment was. Sure. Uh, I could try to summarize. We're we're talking about you know the the notion that we're going from a, an unstable original material, the spicules, and over time through a process probably including pressure, temperature, and fluid flow, that there is a transformation that goes from a stable original material to eventually a stable material of chert. And that migration of the silica itself is part of that process, away from source to the final sink location of where the chert actually is laid down, uh, some distance away from the source. And it seems certainly in that Mississippian example in the limestone that it doesn't actually travel all that far. It only makes it a few centimeters and then oh, it becomes a solid uh, and, and locks in. But, but the ghosts of the spicules stay there. And so in thin section, you still see the uh, evidence of where those spicule, spicules used to be, even though much of their silica has migrated um, away from the original location. It's a really cool chemistry problem, actually. Yeah, another question. But, uh, in the moment, describe the depositional environment that creates phosphates. The depositional environment of phosphates is the question. And that is, wow, that is a lot of ink has been uh, spilled on the notion of where the phosphate, why the phosphates occur in the phosphoria formation. A lot of the phosphates that I'm used to seeing in the mining district in, again, Southeast Idaho towards the basin center, let's say, is uh, a lot of them are pelletal. So they're little peloids, uh, which look like, oh, they look like nerds candy. That's the best way to describe them. Uh, they aren't perfect spheres. They're a kind of blobby, you know, poorly shaped, uh, layered nuggets of phosphate ore. Uh, there was a notion at one point that, oh, they must be deep water or, oh, they must be shallow water. They're not either. I think they're, they're likely occurring in kind of midwater depth. If I had to hazard a guess, you know, probably less than 100 meters and more than 30 meters. So we're probably in the 50, let's say in the 50 meter range, not terribly deep. Um, generally calm water. We find a lot of them in mud rocks that are laminated. Uh, the peloids, the, these, these nerd rocks that I like to think of them as, 
aren't the same thing as ooids that are have to be rolling around in shallow environments. Uh, so they're in relatively calm water where they're forming. Hmm. Chemically, are they basic or acidic? Uh, they are likely basic. Uh, they also co-occur with lots of very high TOC, total organic carbon is extremely high. Uh, so probably reducing conditions, chemically speaking. Um, so, so that's describing the bottom waters at certain times in this basin are probably very low oxygen, probably real toxic to anybody that's trying to live on the seafloor during those little intervals where we get lots of phosphorus. Um, probably stagnant, probably filthy, stinky water, but happy if you're phosphate. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. That, that one. Hey, hey. Okay, so this is after he does a study of all the plastic. Yeah. And it's, if I remember what there was, you know, so it's circular, tubular, circular, columnar. Yeah. The question is, what the heck is the difference between tubular and columnar? And the answer is, yes, they're in different publications. Different authors use different terms. Um, and, and yeah, so the, the green dots as opposed to the purple dots by two different authors. Mm -hmm. This one. Here's our map. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the, qu the question, I guess, comes back to the terminology that's used to describe just the overall shape of these, uh, of, of these, I, I guess, what we're calling sponges. Um, they, you know, they occur in the sandy environments up in Montana, the Shedhorn sandstones up there. Uh, they occur in the pure chirts of the Tosi and the wrecks that we see in this area. Um, so there's a bit of a slight range of environment that we find them in. Um, but as far as I know, and I've talked to some of the miners over the years, no one's ever described in the mining districts where we do get chirts that they are tubular or cylindrical or anything like that. And so that's in the, in my mind, that's kind of in the more basin center, deeper water. We don't seem to be finding them there uh, in the church associated with those. So that's, that's a little gap of where we don't have them. And again, I think these are probably, and it would make sense in my mind for, uh, you know, sponges to have environments where they're happy and happily growing. And maybe that's not in the stinky basin center, but it's along the margins of the, of the bay. Right. And and also you have to be preserving them. So not only do they have to live there, but you also have to have a mechanism by which they're getting buried enough to have a record of them. Because sponges, you know, sponges, when they die, their organic material decays and they disappear. And that's, you know, there's a legitimate reason why we don't find a lot of sponges of this type, demo sponges in the fossil record is they they aren't made to fossilize really nicely. They, they kind of, they're soft and squishy and they fall apart. But if you can bury them and they can certify themselves, bonus, right? You have to have kind of a, a good scenario in order to preserve them whole. Uh, I question if I ever looked at total organic carbon in the church themselves and I have not done that. I have not done that. I think in order to do that, goodness, what would you have to do? You'd have to hydrofluoric acid the thing and <laughs> get the residuum. Ooh, that sounds awful. Um, what would I guess? Well, dissertation, yes, student, play with hydrofluoric acid. Uh, <laughs> just keep it away from me. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Uh, you know, the, so the dark color makes me think that there's organic carbon in there. Or, but it also could be iron, right? Iron's another good thing that, that colors rocks uh, dark. 
Um, I bet there's organic carbon in there. And we have talked, we have talked, there are paleontologists who specialize in organic chemistry of fossils, right? And one of the reasons why we know that, that I, I started off talking about sponges in their history, they go way back 600 plus million years. We know that not because of body fossils, but because we find organic molecules that sponges make or the, the degraded remnants of what sponges make. We find that or, or chemical paleontologists have found that signal. I bet if we gave samples like this to the right person, a, a, a paleontologic chemist, they could probably extract the organic molecules that these sponges once made. Pro very probably. Yeah, TOC being pretty high, I wouldn't be surprised. I fall into the chasm. I want to uh, thank Lee for an excellent presentation, a great way to end the year. Those of you on Zoom, this is uh, this is what one of these sponges looks like. This came from near Ski Lake. Uh, those of you in the room, squeeze it. Handle yeah. it. Uh, so Lee, thank you for an excellent presentation. Appreciate very, very thorough. I look forward to a field trip to see the sponges in situ. Uh, <laughs> chairs, those that way, this this way. This is a small token of our appreciation. Appreciate it. Uh, fossil for paleontology. <laughs> if everyone could just join me in thanking Lee. Thank you. And he'll be plenty of people. Uh, the Zoom audience also thanks you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you very right. much. Yeah. No, uh, this one I found near ski lakes. Well, it's not really near ski lakes. So when you go to ski lakes and you walk up to the divide, if it's a saddle there, you go down that dip slope into Phillips Canyon. That's right there. You have to go to the right slope. I was there with Lee and Will when Lee said, these are sponges. There are like five ways you can go from there, though.